Well, let's, um, let's open up the meeting as usual and um, everyone's present. So let's start by approving the minutes. So everyone, everyone checked over the minutes. Let's have, a, let's have a motion for that. Um, I'll make a motion to accept the minutes of the, the December 21st select board meeting. I'll second. Any, no, no changes or corrections from, from anyone? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. All right, then, so that we won't forget this time, let's do the orders the, uh, now. Does anyone have questions about that? Accounts payable I'm talking about? Um, I do. I thought the activity center is paying their own utilities. Is it just that uh, we have to pay it and then they pay us back, Dave? Uh, where, are you, where are you looking? It's page four of six of the invoices. <clears throat> yeah, so that uh, that's with the hydro uh, contract, and we weren't able to detach that from the activity <laughs> center. It was just kind of too complex to, to pull them out of how that's net metered. Mm -hmm. So correct. Um, that gets that gets kind of sugars off um, the net metering versus what they use, and then the differences they pay. Okay. So the answer is yes. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Did you notice, Mary, that that's a hydro bill? From yes. Martinsville hydro. Yeah, I did, and and I figured they were still attached in order to get that discount, and uh, I just wanted to make sure because we had we had agreed that they would pay their own electricity. Yep. Thank you. Anything else from anyone? Okay, well, that's, I would be looking for a motion then. Accounts payable up to <clears throat> January 4th, 21. I'll second that. Yeah. Can you repeat that, Curtis? I, I didn't hear. I don't know why. I, I would know, need just... to approve the accounts payable up to January 4th, 2021. Okay. Thank you. Any other, any other questions on this? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Still, still aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Dave, do we have any adjustments to the agenda tonight? Uh, only that you need to have a discussion about Martin Luther King Day. Uh, the next meeting would fall on January 18th, which is Martin Luther King Day, and we generally kick that to the 19th. You can officially take that up, but we need to add that. Well, why don't we somewhere. do that right now? That, that's fairly simple. We've always done it, that, uh, well, we haven't always, but within the last several years, we've done it that way. And I would think we would want to continue. Does anyone disagree with that? No, I heartily agree. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Gordon, I missed what the proposal I said that we have been, we have been, um, respecting Martin Luther King Day by not having our meeting and moving it to the next day, like like yeah. holidays 
for a number of years. Okay. Um, we, when when that day was first established, um, us or we like others uh, did not do that correctly for for a time, but we, we have been for quite some time. Okay. So we're moving it from the 18th, which was a Monday, to Tuesday the 19th. That's what we have done in the past. Okay. Sure. Unless there's some kind of a conflict, I don't believe there is. But okay. So, um, do we need a motion for that, Dave, or can you just move it? I uh, wouldn't hurt if you did a motion. I guess okay. you're, you're switching a so, switching a regularly can, scheduled meeting. I okay. can move that in observance of Martin Luther King Jr. Day on January 18th, we move the select board meeting to January 19th. I'll second that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Bill on. Heard his aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay. I'm done. Okay. So now we can open up for public comments. I see we have quite a few people here. Um, is there something someone would like to bring up briefly? Well, if not, we can move along. So, so we move on to old business. And the discussion is how are we going to handle town meeting? Are we going to have town meeting or um, and possibly postpone till sometime in May, or are we going to do it all by um, informing people through the media and, and through um, a meeting, I suppose, a meeting that people could join, similar to this meeting, and um, do our voting by Australian ballot, or what are we going to do? Oh, well, Gordon, the, the legislature has yet to give us a, their final uh, no, guidance on this, right? No, that's right. They weren't yeah. going to give us till for another couple of weeks, I think. I mean, you I know. think sort of building off of what Mary's saying, I don't know if like it's really in our purview. Maybe we could recommend that if they change it, we'll consider if they make it legal for us to, we'll consider changing the date. But I think if we have to make a decision by a certain time in order to have the warnings, then we should just go with the date that currently exists, right? So by next meeting, which is the 19th, uh, we're going to be pretty far along here. So I hope to have the, the articles for the warning at that point. Um, it'll be shortly thereafter. And Brian and Clyde, you can jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, but within or about a week following that, um, they're going to need to be. They're going to need to put the warning together for for town meeting. So I guess you know, thought of, part of the thought process is here is there's a strong inkling that they will pass legislation, but I think that if we just keep the entire discussion until next meeting it could be kind of you know your backs are going to be against the wall so you may want to at least hash some of this out now um or you know if the town clerks have some input that they may want to provide um you know as to to you know what some pros and cons but you know i, I would just hate to see us put this off until you know, 7.30 on the 19th and then try and hash through it, that's all. Uh, Dave and, and Select Board, this is Brian Strafalino here. I'm happy to 
say my two cents uh, again. I I still continue to uh, advocate that we should choose Australian ballot. Um, I think it's ultimately the safest thing that we can do. Um, as Dave alluded to, we're now that we're in January, we've got some deadlines uh, in terms of warning the town and getting all the articles ready to go. Um, if we continue to to aim for March 2nd, um, I did do a brief survey uh, across the state using the listserv just to kind of gauge what other floor vote towns are are thinking and I got 34 responses and 27 towns have already decided to go with Australian ballot and the seven towns that are undecided um, many of them are hoping to uh, potentially delay if legislation passes but all of those towns populations are very small and only Vernon is close in terms of uh, relative population to Heartland um, and they didn't have a decision but they were leaning towards Australian ballot so um, I think it's not a matter of right decision or wrong decision, but I think the best decision for us is to go with Australian ballot for this year. And we know that we can go back to floor voting in 2022, but if we make the decision to go with Australian ballot, we can maintain our schedule. We can uh, vote on March 2nd and I will be able to meet all of our deadlines uh, if we have that decision made. Um, and, and, and also, we, we still just don't know what May or June or, or you know, a warmer month might bring. Um, so so I, I would strongly advocate that we seriously consider Australian ballot and, and make that choice. So Brian, uh, this is Mary O'Brien. I understand uh, your reasons for wanting Australian ballot and they all are very sound. I think uh, what some of us are concerned about is that we will break with tradition and never be able to get back to our town meeting and floor vote. So uh, I think for me personally, that's why this is not an easy decision because we are possibly tampering with over 200 years of tradition and that's worked very well so um i i also want to know if you would be keeping to all your uh schedules or deadlines you could still meet your deadlines isn't it true if um the meeting is in may That's correct, but that's uh, with the hope that legislation will pass and that uh, you as the select board can make that decision to delay. So then essentially all those deadlines would shift to whatever date we decided. So I think the issue is, is, is waiting for legislation and if things don't pass, then we're really going to be um, kind of put in a tight spot to then meet the deadlines that are in place and that we do have to abide by um, legislatively, you know, via statute right now. Um, and and I, I, I would just say I totally respect that fear and I think other towns are concerned that uh, if citizens experience Australian ballot, then they might want that in the future. Um, but that's ultimately, that's that's a possibility at any given year. And I don't think, for me, the concern is around that. It's just a, around public safety and what guidelines are right now. And 
I, I just feel like the best choice is to go Australian ballot this year and we can keep people safe. We've got a system that is in place and that I have I have successfully participated in. So I feel very confident that we could just essentially handle business on the second and put this behind us and and then move towards uh, you know other things that we need to address and and revert back to uh, floor on the floor town meeting in 2022. So there are other towns that um, express that similar concern, uh, but ultimately they decided to go up to Australian ballot because as the statute is written right now, you can make the choice to go Australian ballot for this year only, and then you revert back to on the floor or, or however your voting process was for your town. Right, I, I understand that, um, but I I hope everybody who's thinking of this is really taking seriously what our forebears have established and worked really well. I, for one, I'm very leery of um, messing with, like I said, a, a 200 plus year uh, tradition. So thank you. Dave, can, can you um, outline what kind of what you have in mind for getting information out if we should go on by Australian ballot? It seems, I mean, my experience with going to school meetings has been dismal um, because the public does not show up uh, at almost not existent uh, compared to the size of the town. And I know that we have had fairly good coverage with the newspapers, but other than that, how are we how are we going to explain the budget like we normally do uh, to the people who are going to vote on this? Uh, yep. Yeah. And um, Phil, I'm not sure if you were trying to say something earlier, but I think you were muted. Um, so I had chat there a little bit, but um, uh, to be honest with you, Gordon, I haven't completely thought this out yet um, just because of where we are in the process, um, but I would lean pretty heavily on uh, the Ron standard in, in the Valley News to, you know, let people know that the town has made a decision. Uh, we would use the listserv uh, as well. Um, there's the town report, which is going to be put out uh, we generally have prepared um, generally. I didn't miss a year. We've got it ready to go before the school meeting. Um, so it gets out. Um, we can maybe push that back a couple of days. So the informational meeting could be the night before uh, the actual vote, or it can be no less than uh, or, or no less than 10 days before. So or no more than 10 days before. Uh, so uh, you got a little bit of leeway there, so I would probably utilize um, the newspapers, the listserv, um, the town report uh, to get the word out that town meeting has been changed to Australian ballot. And then we can use, as we get a little bit closer uh, in, in towards the end of January into February, we could always um, do or give some consideration as to how we would want to address, um, you know, the budget and getting questions answered on the budget, et cetera. Uh, again, the last time we talked about this, I think I mentioned Curtis's, um, the way we use that for um, the intersection uh, is a possibility, something that we can discuss um, as an option. But uh, I think I would probably move that way. Um, to get it out, I don't. I think that um, you know, getting the word out that we've switched and we're going to Australian ballot um, is kind of the easy part. Getting them to attend the informational meeting is, um, you know, will be the the um, you know a little bit more of a challenge. Uh, I did speak to. Uh, interestingly enough, now that I'm thinking about this, uh, I did get a phone call from CATV. Uh, both Thomas and uh, Donna, the executive director, um, they've been 
Um, you know, Hartford and Hanover have utilized them uh, a little bit more when it comes to their meetings and perhaps doing uh, a little bit more of a push as far as getting it out um, via the cable channel uh, or streaming and maybe being able to, you know, live stream or over the cable channel instead of maybe taped, but have it live, kind of like what Hartford does. I uh, have the informational meeting and have some advertising behind it. CATV has um, reached out to me and, and asked what kind of assistance I think I might be able to use. I don't know how we can use CATV yet, uh, but I think that there's certainly an option uh, to use, whether it be, um, you know, when they called me, they were thinking that um, we might be thinking about a remote town meeting and how they can participate in that. Legislature hasn't given us that ability to do that, but I think that CATV could probably be utilized um, more than we've done in the past for an informational meeting. And I think that, um, you know, I'd have to talk that through a little bit more with Donna and Thomas, but I think that that's also a pretty strong possibility. Therefore, somebody who's not quite as uh, savvy with, say, Microsoft Teams might be able to watch it on cable. Um, you know, and maybe even have a phone in or a, a dial in to ask questions or something to that effect. Um, so there may be some resources out there that we haven't tapped into that might make it a little bit more user friendly. Dave, I'll uh, also add um, that in the clerk's office, we've talked about uh, do mailing a postcard. We already need to do a mailing for um, dog licenses and uh, the lack of a rabies clinic this year because of COVID, so things are changing uh, in, in the clerk's office as well. Um, so we um, are able to, to mail all of our uh, dog owners and, and also um, people who haven't licensed their dogs, but we think that they do. We, we're gonna send them a postcard and Clyde and I talked about potentially uh, doing something similar for all registered voters in town, um, you know, notifying them what we choose to do and uh, and and how we're going to proceed. Um, I know that a lot of other towns are doing several informational meetings, and um, I think utilizing CATV and potentially recording something, um, a discussion around the budget, and having that accessible. Um, in addition to uh, the actual live informational meeting would just give people as many avenues and opportunities to get a sense of what they're potentially voting on. We're also going to We would have to provide an absentee ballot, but I'm sorry. Yep. We would not, um, it would be up to the select board to decide whether we we mail that to all registered voters. Uh, you don't need to do that, and the state is not going to provide assistance with postage for that. They are going to, um, they are supplying us with the envelopes. Uh, but I know that a lot of the uh, towns in our geographical area that have already made the decision to go Australian ballot are not planning on mailing absentee ballot and specifically in our uh, school supervisory union it's really important that we um, are aware what the other towns are doing because if one town does decide to mail absentee ballots to all their registered voters I think by statute every town in that supervisory union needs to but I've already been reaching out to some of those other towns and they ha are not going to mail uh, absentee ballots to everybody. Um, they will just supply them upon request. And I think if we had the, the, if we did go with Australian ballot, we would follow suit and we would not mail to all registered voters. We would just uh, provide them um, upon request. Uh, Gordon, I have a yeah. question. If we would decide this year to do the Australian ballot and next year rolls around and everything's fine for 
traditional town meeting, even if there was some feeling that we should just always do Australian ballot, that would not be um, possible without a approval from the voters. Is that correct? That, that is that, correct. That is, yeah. Yeah. Um, Mrs. Phil, um, I, I find it interesting that we're talking about pre meetings and pre virtual meetings in CATV when I thought the one thing that we did do the last time we met is we agreed to dismiss uh, virtual meetings because of the complexity of those virtual meetings to the average citizen. Um, so I, I, I still think we're between a rock and a hard place as far as um, as far as the echo here. Um, Phil, 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 so uh, what we're talking about is an informational meeting that we yeah, need. I understand, to Brian. Right. An informational right. virtual meeting is going to be just as hard as a virtual meeting for the hundred and something people that come for a town meeting. Um, and, and, and I don't know what you're talking about you know, with CATV. Is this going to be something they would film and then we would teach people how to how to stream data or to find a CATV station on on on, on, on their network. Um, so I, I think there's some technical challenges there that we're just we may, perhaps we're glossing over right now. Um, I, I think Phil, I think you're probably right that there are these technical challenges that we're glossing over, but I think the decision facing us is a lot simpler then we're making it out to be. And that decision is, given that there is no currently legal way to delay town meeting, do we want to require citizens to congregate in an enclosed area on town meeting day for town meeting? Or do we want to, under the current setup that we have, take the only option afforded by the legislature, which is switching for a single year that automatically reverts back to floor vote town meeting for two Australian ballots. I, I, Curtis, I agree. And I understand the practicality that's in front of us. But when I read the VLTC site, I didn't get, the, you know, yes, the legislature hasn't sort of said we can do this, but there was every sort of tendency to sort of say, if they were betters, yes, this would, is what would be happening. If we had to make an absolute decision right now, I would, I would have to be practical and say Australian ballot. But I hear Mary, and I also concur that, um, you know, we should explore what an out, outdoor meeting would be. Um, I'm not worried about you know, not having a town meeting in 2022, um, uh, you know, might, it might set a precedent where there might be nothing in 2023 if there is a vote. But um, so I guess my question is, do we have to make that absolute decision tonight? And if we do, I know what my choice would be. I think we're now, Phil, we talked about this uh, a few minutes ago that we're doing a lot of discussing tonight to get um, so that we can more easily uh, come up with a decision on the 19th. I believe that's what Dave proposed. Am I right, Dave? Yes. So we don't have to, we're not going to vote tonight, but we want to talk about it um, considerably to, uh, to a good extent. Dave, um, I think I misheard you earlier then. I misinterpreted what you said earlier because I'm surprised to hear you just now agree with Gordon. I had thought you said earlier you were hoping to get a decision made to allow the clerk's office enough time to produce the resources and all the things that they need. You were hoping to have that decision made today, but then Gordon said next time. So I that's, just, that's what I thought I heard as well. No, you so to so. I said two things. One, uh, by January 19th, you guys should be honing in on a decision. I'd hate to wait until the 19th 
to have a conversation and then try and make a decision. So what I was pushing you to do was to at least have, because you started this out by not even conversing and saying, oh, we can just put it off until the 19th. Uh, I think that you guys should start this discussion. We started it last meeting. I think you should continue this discussion and then finish the discussion on the 19th. I, knowing this board, I, I don't think it's healthy to go cold turkey into the 19th and then try and hash it out and make a decision. Is yeah, that's all, all clear? <clears throat> yep, that's clear. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um. <clears throat> I want to just, so, so Stacy asked, you know, isn't it against the mandate to have meetings and the answer is, of course, yes. And Mary said yes as well. And we are not considering that. So as it currently stands, according to the legislation that's available, the only other option is Australian ballot. We have to wait for new legislation to even have a second option, right? That is correct. But we, we should know by the 19th if they uh, follow through with what uh, we read read that they were in the newspaper what they were going to try to do. So we we'll have to wait and see on that. I think Curtis that uh, if the legislation doesn't happen, then it's an easy decision. Uh, it, it's been strongly been implied that they intend to pass legislation to put, you know, allow a town to put off until a further date. Uh, they go into, you know, legislation, uh, legislative session starts this week. Uh, they were hoping to pass that like immediately. Uh, if they don't, then I think it's a very easy decision. I think it may be worth just kicking the can around a little bit so that, again, we're not having a four hour meeting on the 19th. So I think this would be my question then to you, Dave, yeah. because it seems to me also that if they do pass it, that that's a relatively easy decision that we would we would kick it down the road. We would have it at a later date. So what would complicate that decision in your mind? What what would make it preferable for us to have Australian ballot? on town meeting day versus a floor vote later in the year. So I think Brian just laid out a pretty good argument. Uh, he spent the first five minutes of this discussion basically making a recommendation that uh, if you have either decision, uh, you don't have the second one yet. But either way, what I'm hearing from him is that the recommendation <clears throat> from him is that you hold an Australian ballot I'm trying to maintain some neutrality in this discussion, but you know, I, some of his points are good points. It's a known. We've been down that road. We've done the primary. We've done the presidential election. We did the three corners intersection um, vote with an informational meeting. Um, so you know, that's kind of a known. We follow the same track that we have. It's done on March second. You know, when we move on to other things, as he said, the pitfalls of putting it off till May is in unknown. You know, we're not where we need to be. Um, we still can't conjugate. Uh, you still need to conjugate six feet apart and possibly wear a mask. Um, that's a very, very large tent, um, or you just have it outside, which then becomes weather dependent. Uh, you know, the, the Plus to that, as Mary pointed out, is you maintain town meeting. Uh, you're able to maintain discussion. You're able to maintain a floor vote. You're able to maintain, um, you know, your, you know, what you've done for 200 years. So there's some pros and cons here um, that are, you know, some pretty serious pros and cons outside of, you know, okay, that's just what we've historically done. Um, I think that there is some thought process to be had here. Uh -huh. 
Well, I would. This is Mary. I am not arguing for maintaining the town meeting structure as it is, uh, for the sake of it's. We've always done it that way, and I want to continue to do it that way. I think there's great value in the town meeting as we've had it, and uh, I, I don't want uh, in in the. Um, for efficiency's sake or convenience sake to throw that away blithely. And so I I would like everybody who's thinking about this to to really seriously think about what we have, this rich tradition that's worked so well. And uh, what are we exchanging it for? Um, and uh, we may not be able to go back. So that's that's my point is not to keep it just because we've always had it. But no, no, it's it's very valuable. If you've ever been to one, I think you'd appreciate that. Mary, I think an interesting thing about if we were to do it, but we still wanted to maintain the benefit from the floor vote of a town meeting day is it's actually within statute to have some things voted on on the floor and some things voted on uh, by Australian ballot. So it could be the case that if there were, if we went through the experience once, we might see that there are genuinely actually some things that could benefit from being placed on an Australian ballot. We and do so that now. We do that now, Curtis. Okay, cool. Um, well, <clears throat> I tend to agree with Mary here, and uh, I, I see the Australian ballot route to be kind of an easy way out. No question that it would be simpler. I'm, I'm concerned about how we would ever provide enough tent space. You know, if it happened to be a beautiful day, it wouldn't be a big problem, but what if it wasn't? Um, and I think that we're the way the pandemic is winding down rather slowly, I think we're going to still be in a situation where we can't, where we have to be very cautious. So that that's kind of a scary unknown of how to pull that off. But the, the value of town meeting is, in my mind, is just immense. You can actually People can stand up and take their turn presenting their points of view, and you can come up with a, a decision on a on whatever that is being debated um, in a much better fashion than you can with uh, a lot of the voters who uh, are partially informed. Some will be informed very well; they always are. Some will not be. And so I, I don't know. I, I I am torn between one way or the other because of the problems of pulling it off compared to the Australian ballot are, are quite sizable. And but I still I, I value town meeting uh, tremendously, and I want it to continue. So. I don't know what to think. If Clyde has had his hand raised. Oh, I, I couldn't. OK, go ahead, Clyde. I don't know where you are. But. <clears throat> well, as I mentioned at the last meeting, with our traditional town meeting, with the capacity of Damon Hall at its fullest, we allow a little over one half of 1% of the voters of the town of Heartland to attend town meeting. So that being said, uh, the Australian ballot, yeah, there are pros and cons, of course, well, I'll switch horses. In my almost 40 years of working with the town from being moderator to town clerk and whatever, I've noticed at regular town meeting that if a group has an ax to grind, they will pack that meeting so the vote will go the way they want it. 
if uh, and I can uh, some of the resolutions that have been brought in were only passed because a group got together and got a majority of their people at the meeting voted to, for instance, uh, ban nuclear testing or nuclear uh, uranium mining in Heartland. And as soon as that vote passed, they were out the door. They could care less about the million dollar budget that was going to be passed. So um, the other thing is uh, I got news from Michelle today that the the drop box that we ordered with our uh, Zuckerberg money that we were given has arrived and that can be put out front so ballots can be dropped ahead of time. Uh, of course, I have to have cooperation of the road crew to affix it to the concrete pad out there, but uh, so it would cut down drastically on traffic at Neiman Hall on the second uh, if people wanted to just drop their ballot out in the box out front. Uh, we've also figured out that this could be used for tax collection and other things that want to be dropped off at town hall. But uh, it just is that we have so over the years limited in percentage of people who could actually vote on the question, the budget, or other questions that come up. Now, when town meeting started, the population of Heartland was a lot less, and so the participation percentage was higher. And as our population grows and our registered voters grow, open town meeting constantly restricts who can vote on the budget, who can vote on any other question. So that's my two cents worth, and I'll shut myself off. Well, I this is Mary. I would say that what restricts people's uh, ability to vote is to show up at town meeting, which a number of people choose not to go. They're not limited by the size of Damon Hall, the capacity, because I don't believe anybody's ever been turned away. And uh, the town meeting was held as school multipurpose room for a while, and you know I don't think we saw any greater participation. So I I I would take issue with that argument, but yeah, we that that also applies, um, Mrs. Gordon. That also applies to um, times that we have changed the date, and other towns have tried it also. People said, "No, I have to work. I can't I can't go." So we have it on Saturday. It doesn't make any difference. Um, people have people that want to go seem to figure out how to go. I'm sure there are people who would like to go that can't come for one reason or another, but uh, I don't know. I think one thing we we would have to prepare for if we do Australian ballot, no matter what, is a dramatic increase in turnout. So the in this last annual meeting year, um, towns that held it Australian ballot had a turnout of around 54%. And towns that held it with floor vote had a turnout of 6%. That's using VLCT's data. And in Heartland, our town meeting day last year was 6%. And our Australian ballot votes averaged around 50% voter turnout. So if we switch to Australian ballot, it will be, a, regardless, it will be a huge increase in turnout. I think too that it, you'll find um, is that the people who don't go to town meeting because they choose not to or they can't uh, feel comfortable enough with the decisions that people who are able to attend that they make that that is why town meeting has been going forward as it has. People feel like, okay, the people who are going are informed, are interested, and uh, I'm generally happy with the decisions they make. Yeah, you're right, Mary. That they're, they're, people that go to town meeting are, are voluntary legislators, and uh, it seems to work well. 
I mean, I think the real way to answer the question as to if the rest of the community thinks those voluntary legislatures actually work well is to put the question to the voters. Um, but that's not what we're proposing. As far as I know, though, um, has the town of Heartland had a vote ever on if they, the town in general, uh, was on board with these self-appointed voluntary legislatures? Legislative. You are just really, you're just playing with fire here, Curtis. I, I don't think you've ever been to a town meeting, so I don't think you can possibly value it the way the rest of us do. And again, we are not self-appointed legislators. That was just a descriptive phrase that Gordon used. Uh, it, it, it's very meaningful to the people who go. And I, I caution you to please treat it with the respect of the 250 year history it has earned. I mean, I don't think anything I said was either disrespectful nor aggressive. And I feel like your response uh, was very targeted and high energy towards me, Mary. And because, I don't think because of your I opinion said, on this, I, I don't feel aggressive. I, I feel passionate about it. I don't have an opinion. What I said was in response to you saying, everyone is fine with the people who make those decisions. What I said was there's actually a mechanism in place to evaluate if that is true. I said nothing about my opinion. I said nothing about your opinion. I didn't denigrate it. I didn't use polemics. I just said there exists an actual thing. Anyone else want to weigh in? This this is John. If if uh, if you're willing, sure, John. Um, so approaching this as a as a scientist in my other life, um, the uh, the number of months between if I I didn't read the the VLCT documentation, I think I overheard that. We may be talking about a delay of town meeting from March until May. Did I understand that correct? Yes. So as a scientist, um, looking at the exponential growth of COVID in our area and all areas, um, any sort of decay in a March, April, May, you know, two month period between when it's currently um, slated to occur in March and when it might occur in May, if, if the legislature approves is, um, I think going to be fairly statistically insignificant in the risk. In other words, I think our risk is still going to be very elevated to possibly host a safe town meeting in May. And um, I just, I just want to put that out there. Um, regardless of what the decision is, I'd be very surprised if we're able to safely host in any sort of um, physical, um, tent or other capacity, a safe town meeting and only a two month delay. Yeah. I, I have the same concern, John. I understand that the, the, the salvation is supposed to be the vac vaccine. That's that's a slow process. So. Yeah, I used the word practical before when I was trying to make my points. Um, uh, I, I, we, you know, it's a good discussion about having a town meeting or not having a town meeting, uh, but that's really not to be talked about tonight. Um, I mean, I, I, it feels a little bit different, but similar to canceling old home days. Um, I mean, I don't think there's any one of us that's going to stand up and say old home days is a thing of the past and it's really bad for the community. Um, you know, uh, I don't think any of us want to say town meetings should be changed. Um, but that's not the point of the discussion tonight. The point of the discussion is we're faced with COVID-19 and goodness knows COVID-2 
20 or 21, whatever it's being called. Um, and and um, so I think we have to take a practical approach. And I, I'll continue to think about it between here and the 19th, but I kind of feel like I know what's emerging. Okay. Well, it seems like we maybe hit hit the points we need to hit. Somebody else is something different. Thank everybody for their comments. So, without any without objection, I think we move on. Is that Okay. Uh, Gordon, yeah. I guess this would have one general question. Um, uh, what is the best way for us to pay attention to what's happening in Mount Pillar? I mean, I, I, I'm, I don't read any sort of websites about what votes happen you know, day to day. Is it, is it looking at the Vermont League of City and Towns? I suspect it'll probably be on the front page of the Valley News. Um, but uh, I'm sure Brian and I will also notify you guys that a decision has been made from the legislature. Uh, until then, I haven't heard anything deviate from what we've been talking about for the past two meetings. Um, last meeting and this meeting has been seems to be where things are heading. So as soon as something comes out, uh, we can we can let you know. Otherwise, Phil, the VLCT website still remains pretty, pretty strong for question and answers and stuff like that. Right, and I get emails from them as well as I'm sure others do. So. Okay. All right. So let's move on to the next item on rural business, which is, uh, I think, Dave would like to see uh, approval of the budget for the. Fiscal year 2022. So I'll open that up for discussion. Um, we've, I think we've discussed this quite thoroughly, especially last meeting. There's probably not much more that we can do, but um, anybody that's got anything to bring up, this is the time to do it. Gordon, this is Mary. Yes. I, sure. I uh, discussed my objections the last meeting, so I don't want to go over that again, but I will not be voting for the budget. Thank you. But this is probably my first time ever. Well, I, I, I would like to say say that uh, I, I, I definitely had some objections to the budget and some thoughts that that I thought might be um more sensitive to the to the voters considering the situation that a lot of people are in um i shouldn't say voters taxpayers and but i i also realized that our town manager has and and other department heads have i believe um worked really hard to present a budget that tries to address both sides of the of the money issue, the things that have to be um, done, the things that should be done, and the ability of taxpayers to pay their pay their bills. So I I um, with, with some apprehension I will support the budget. You're muted, Phil. 
Phil, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> um, Gordon, thank you for your comments. I appreciate your points and agree with your points. Uh, I feel that we have a budget that is fairly lean. Um, I think we all feel like we lost something in this budget that could have been done, um, that won't be done. Um, but I also feel that this is a budget that will allow us to continue to make small progress on the roads, continue to have infrastructure maintenance done, uh, and to introduce the, the new position for the town ordinance enforcement, which I think all sum to be a very responsibly presented budget. So I do support it. Hey, Gordon, this is Curtis. Apparently my webcam. Oh, Martha, were you going to talk? Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Go ahead. Um, so I definitely uh, respect the position that uh, Mary reiterated today and brought up yesterday about the potential for financial hardships that people in town are or could be experiencing. And I think that's really important to always keep that at the forefront of our minds and have that be something that we're thinking about. I think the people involved in constructing this budget, both our professionals like Dave and John and our paraprofessionals like, sorry, John Leonard in the professional and our paraprofessionals uh, like John Sanders and people like that have worked with that idea at the forefront of their mind, how to ensure that the cost of running town is distributed most equitably and how it can have the smallest impact on people as possible. That has always been in their minds and I don't think we could have come to this lean budget that Phil pointed out without that being a guiding principle in their minds. But it's important to note that the town is, as evidenced by the grand list, growing, and that that growth requires additional effort and work on the part of our professionals and paraprofessionals. And without growing that part of the budget, that will help support those things. It would be hard to expect the same level of service and delivery that we've had from those people. So I think that this budget increase, keeping all of those things in mind as a guiding principle as they have from the beginning, is actually a really responsible way um, to make sure that the services we provide in town are kept at a high level and their costs are kept down. Thanks. Uh, yes, I I have a lot of the same reservations that Mary has and that Gordon outlined. But after hearing the impassioned support from people I respect, like Doug Linnell and John Sanders, I will vote in favor of the budget and leave it up to the voters to uh, do the final decision. Thank you very much, Martha. Well, Phil, are you thinking about saying something else? I was wondering if you wanted a motion. Yeah, I think that I think we could do that. Sure. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't 
um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I, I hope it would suffice to say, make a motion to accept the fiscal year 22 budget as presented. Dave, you're muted. You can give it a number of three million eighty-six thousand seven hundred dollars, excluding appropriations. Uh, please say that number again. Three million eighty-six thousand seven hundred. And that's excluding appropriations. Martha, can you add that and read it back to us? Um, Phil made the motion to accept the FY22 budget as presented. Three million. $86,700 excluding appropriations. Thank you. Mary, are you? What? You're beeping. I mean, you're flashing. You want? I can't see you. Oh. Did you want to say something? No. Oh, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I'm looking for a second here. Gordon, this is Curtis. I'll second the motion. Okay, thank you. So is there more discussion? Any further discussion on this? not i'll take the vote then all in favor say aye you alive martha aye curtis aye yeah, go ahead and aye and all opposed say nay this is mary i say no nay with uh, respect and regret thank you okay so that passes Gordon, could I add uh, a comment here? Um, sure. I mean, we as a select board just made a decision on the budget, um, and and I feel that um, part of our role as being select people is to communicate why we agree that this is the budget presented. So I would hope all of us um, step up to the challenge of talking to our neighbors and and um when you're selecting your beer at mike's or bg's or bringing home some groceries that you you um talk about the work that went into this and and what we actually had done so so i just would ask that we all support it um publicly okay can i make a small comment too gordon sure uh, I just want to say directly to Mary that I think your dissent and your reasoning behind it is really important and really valuable. And it, I, everyone knows that it's really hard to be very strong in a thing you believe in the face of a group of people who are saying something different. And I just want to tell you personally that I really respect that position you held, and I think it's a valuable position i appreciate that curtis it's very kind of you to say um it's uh it is hard to be the only naysayer but uh i believe in in having the um courage of my conviction so um that's why i weighed in the way i did and let you know let the voters decide as everybody's been saying Very good. <clears throat> it's a good outcome. <clears throat> so, 
So, let's see some other comments. We'll move on on the agenda. Arthur, you, I see, I guess not. <laughs> okay, we've got um, um, a couple of other, other things under the budget article to discuss. We've got uh, appropriations in general, I suppose. Do we want to go over that at all, uh, Dave? And we've got the one new possibility. Um, no, I think the appropriations are pretty well. Um, I think, you know, you'll need to bring up, um, there was a request from the Heartland Mutual Aid um, that you all should have received. Um, if not, I can I can go over that for you. Um, all the other appropriations are have come in. Um, we addressed the fire department and the Upper Valley Health folks uh, last meeting, or the meeting before, so that's kind of, um, you know, kind of been put in front of us. So I think it's just a matter of um, kind of the same process for the Heartland Mutual Aid uh, as we did for the last two. I think that the issue here is that this is a new, it's a new request. Uh, we haven't seen them in the past. Of course, they're new to us in the springtime. Um, so there's two ways that they can get on the ballot uh, or rephrase that on the warning they can petition for it or they can um you know come to the select board and the select board can put them on uh, based upon the discussion that we had with the upper valley folks uh, i think the discussion here is simply we're in a pandemic um, and do we really want people out and about collecting signatures i think that the last time in the upper valley discussion the answer was um, that we are willing to put them, you know, or consider putting them on on the warning. So I think uh, in this instance, the decision here is more or less the select board putting this on the warning, and then you know it goes on the warning, and then the voters will will vote on it. I think that that's essentially what we have in front of us tonight. You do uh, each have a letter uh, in front of you or I did send it electronically. I can put it up on the screen if you need to, um, you know, kind of outlining the request, some needs from the Heartland Mutual Aid. Um, I do know, I don't see Kara Curtis did, um, gonna, is there someone to speak on behalf of the Mutual Aid group or? Yeah, so, um, I will start by saying that I will just go ahead and recuse myself from any vote to put this appropriation request on the warning. Um, and we were hoping to have Kira Kelly here um, to talk you through it, but she needed to be at the uh, Richmond Select Board meeting on an unrelated matter. So I guess I will um, sort of take up that mantle. Um, so the main motivation to uh, put in this appropriation request um, is actually was a, was a result of um, many of the things that Mary has been saying about the budget over the last month or two, in addition to the things that we in the group have seen on the ground. Um, so just a brief history, uh, we started last March um, and there's a core group of five volunteers and then Kira Kelly and I uh, do a lot of the heavy lifting for the group uh, in response to the COVID pandemic we started. Uh, the first thing we did was put out a survey for uh, possible volunteers and we received 111 uh, responses to that survey with people saying they would be able to do everything from social calls to cutting firewood to all sorts of things. There were a ton of categories that people indicated they could do. Um, and at that point in time we opened up a request form. Um, we 
have had 15 requests um, in that time. They have ranged from getting groceries up to um, providing rental assistance. Uh, some of these have been in conjunction, well, one of them actually, um, was also a Merrick Campbell request. And then some of them we have ended up tackling in combination with the um, Heartland Community Project and the Food Shelf and Aging in Heartland and these different organizations in town. So the key thing that differentiates mutual aid from the other organizations we have in town, except for Aging and Heartland, I think it's important to say, is that our main emphasis is on um, volunteers. So our main effort is in trying to get people who have um, excess skills or abilities or time or resources uh, in contact with people who could benefit from using those resources. So the way that has worked on the ground is that we engage our volunteer base uh, to <coughs> fulfill these requests. And also, importantly, we connect individuals to other services that um, could help them in the ways that they need. So we have a group of people who um, does sort of volunteer as needed um, kind of case management. Uh, like the light version of what we've talked about in the past with Merrick Campbell to help find resources and connect people to the resources that will best help them. As a part of that, we've been on these check-in calls that Dave has held um, just about monthly with the various social services in town um, to try to get everyone on the same page. And the general consensus from those calls is that the sharing of resources and experiences and being able to interface with other organizations has added a lot of value to each of the social services, so social service agencies in town. So we would like to more formally take on the kind of bridge role um, that we informally took on at the beginning of the year. And to do that, uh, we would like to do two main things, uh, one of which would be to establish a um, centralized resource of all of the social service agencies that service Heartland and have a search mechanism that allows people who are experiencing need to really quickly filter down to the various agencies that might be able to help them and get direct contact information there. So that's the sort of forward facing bridge uh, we would like to build. And then the internally facing bridge we would like to build is uh, the creation of a um, a custom, not custom built, but sort of custom configured project management software that would allow all of the social service agencies in town to be on it. And this software would perform two main functions. One would be to have knowledge base articles that any social service agency could access when they have a, a need. So for instance, if someone gets a rental request, rental assistance request, they could go directly to the knowledge base article on rental assistance. They could see all of the state and local agencies that offer rental assistance, their contact information, and how to fill out the applications. Then the second main part of that internally facing tool would be a way for these organizations to communicate across silos so that they can um, get people access to the services that are best suited for their needs. This sort of um, aggregation and communication platform has been shown to be kind of like a force multiplier in social service dollars because it allows those dollars to be spent 
in the most effective way. Then in addition to that, one of our main aims as a volunteer organization has been to divorce uh, volunteering of time and effort from financial requirements. So it's often the case that if you volunteer for something, uh, you're also sort of expecting to take it on the chin or on the pocketbook a little bit. So if you volunteer to pick up groceries for someone, uh, you might end up needing to buy something that would be useful for them. The example I gave in the letter would be, for instance, if someone has celiacs and the food shelf doesn't have gluten-free pasta, the volunteer who's offering their time to go and get those groceries for the person who needs it wouldn't be out those two dollars of their own pocket. Instead, there would be an incidental fund that they would be able to ask for reimbursements for those expenses from. And this would allow us to best take advantage of the volunteer resources that we have uh, without tying ability to volunteer to ability to pay for the opportunity to volunteer. So those are the three main categories that um, we would be asking for in the appropriation request. And when we came to you today, um, the goal would be um, for you all to allow us to be placed on the warning and give us the opportunity to communicate to the people in Heartland the benefit that could be derived from this appropriation. So uh, thank you for listening and reading if you are able to. Yes, Bill, go ahead. Curtis, I'm fully aware that we're not voting on the benefit or the uh, non-benefit of, 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 of the, this mutual aid proposal. Um, but I do find as a select board person, I'd like to know more. Um, so if you can bear with me, I have some questions um, on that part. First off, you said we a number of times. Um, how? You, and I know you've had numerous, um, uh, we had many, many, many more people sort of volunteering than we actually had needs. But uh, who, the, the letter wasn't signed, so I don't know who mutual aid is. It's obviously yourself. Are there others? Oh, yeah. Uh, do, you have a, do you have a list of questions or do you want me to address them as they come? Uh, I think I'm building, so go ahead and address the first one. Okay. Yeah, so we have these 111 volunteers, and then uh, within that volunteer, we have two sort of tiers of, or I guess three, but two tiers of additional involvement, uh, one of which is what we call coordinating volunteers who interface from each individual request to the larger pool of volunteers. And then there's a sort of core group of volunteers that um, take in the requests and work through it. So that core group of volunteers would be the we that I am referring to. Mm -hmm. um, that group includes, um, that group includes myself, Kira Kelly, um, Mary Ann Van Buren, Andy Kelly, and Lex Johnston. Great, thank you. Um, I, I felt rather sad last year when the Heartland Resilience Group, which was a Crow group based on, on the state principles of that resilience, um, that there was a falling out and that you guys could not resolve the difference. Um, and that doesn't sit well with me that um, there was some sort of power play at the time. And I'll just let that hang, but it, it didn't feel very good from afar. So, um, Phil, if you could, if you could, sort of tell me what your conception of that power play is, I might be able to. Um, well, the members of the group, like group left. So, you know, they they decided not to join this new emerging mutual aid group. And again, I don't want to go too deep here because it's not. It's just I'm trying to get facts here. I'm not trying to get. Um, 
too far off course. So the good news is there are actual facts about that, which is um, two weeks ago, there was a meeting of the Heartland Resilience Team, uh, which is the Heartland chapter of the Community Resilience Organization, which is the state organization. Mm -hmm. um, and at that meeting that was attended by all the currently active members, and I attended as well, um, there was a, there was agreement to work within the Crow organization to provide oversight um, for the funds that were appropriated. Okay. So there actually is no there is no struggle of anything. Um, there actually we're we're all on on board with it. Oh, that's good news. Is there now going to be one group or are there two groups? So the the Heartland Resilience Team. Uh, considers their mission as sort of a more broadly based thing than just this mutual aid and they would like to consider or to continue with that as their primary active goal um, and then allow a subgroup of us underneath this the crow group um, to to operate the the mutual aid okay Okay, um, the final two comments, um, uh, external bridges and internal bridges. Um, I think many have gone before you to try to tackle the external bridge of how to sort of connect people. Uh, I'm very, very glad you're recusing yourself, uh, just given your conversation with a small group about how to establish that external bridge a little bit better within town. So thank you for, for doing that. Uh, I'm also become aware that the United Way also has try, is trying to offer the same service. Um, and I hadn't been aware of that until just this week. Um, so there are, this goes to my point that I made at town meeting last year is that there's an awful lot of players here and they're all trying to do the same good thing. Uh, and I just think you're going to be one of, one of many, so it's just, just my own personal comment. And the second personal comment is um, you're very articulate with talking about a knowledge database. Um, and I can only say that I spent hundreds of thousands of dollars of Dartmouth money trying to establish knowledge databases. and we're still spending money, my colleagues, past colleagues, are still spending money trying to get there. So for the amount of money that you're asking for, I, I just can't get the two together. Um, can you maybe just help me understand you know, that part? Yeah, um, so most of this knowledge um, that we're talking about that would go into the knowledge base, um, there's, there's really two things two aspects of it. One is that it's constrained. Um, and two is that it is existing, but it is dispersed. So um, the constrained is to say that um, it's about a, a limited, a more limited set of topics than a very complex organization like uh, Dartmouth deals with on a daily basis. And the other thing is that um, that knowledge actually, most of it already exists um, in organizations that serve the area. So the goal wouldn't be um, to make something very fancy that has lots of cross references that go from article to article and helps build a little web that you can crawl along. And the goal wouldn't be to create new knowledge. The goal would be when an organization gets a request that they don't know how to deal with immediately, such as rental assistance, they're able to go and look for the article on rental assistance and see the, first of all, see the combined knowledge of the other groups in the area. And then second of all, um, as if they gain any more knowledge on that to contribute directly back to uh, the knowledge base entry. 
Thank you, Curtis. Thanks. And I do, I do want to say, so Helen, Helen just had a question about why the food shelf doesn't hear about the dietary needs of the group in discussion. And I want to say, like, Helen, I, I almost, I almost wish I could tell everyone this was a setup, but it wasn't a setup. Helen, this is exactly what that internal bridge is designed to solve that problem right there. So that if a group like Aging in Heartland or like a Mutual Aid runs into a specific dietary need, they have, there's, a, there's almost like an automatic way of communicating that information to the food shelf. So we have um, Mutual Aid as a group has worked in conjunction with the food shelf uh, several times over this year, this last year, thank goodness we can say that now, uh, several times over this last year, uh, putting together boxes of food and resources for people who weren't able to get it on their own. And um, I apologize, Helen, that the communication on specific dietary needs was not made in exactly the right way, but my hope would be that tools like the one we've proposed uh, would help um, everyone communicate about those <coughs> needs across these various agencies. Curtis, I have a question. Yeah. Um, you, you first off started out with what you called a forward facing bridge. And I think that is uh, uh, what you're trying to, how are you trying to get to the people who need the aid? Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. And it, I know that your your basis uh, for this org organization seems to be through um, computer electronics, and the people who are you're trying to connect with may not have that uh, equipment or that ability. Mm -hmm. And what they really need is uh, to talk to their neighbor or give you a call on the telephone. Yeah. So how? How are you dealing with that? Yeah, um, this was also not a setup, I promise. Um, so that was actually at the forefront of our mind when we established um, a method for asking for a request. So we received money last year from the Grassroots Fund uh, to distribute a mailer to all the residents of Heartland. So we sent a mailer out um, in the post that included a phone number that they could call and information to where they could find us on the internet. So we established a phone number, a hotline. That hotline, um, when someone calls it, it calls five different people <laughs> receive the call at the same time. Uh, anyone can answer that and put in the information uh, for the other people. So we've always had that at the forefront of our minds and we we're actively considering how we can continue a non electronic means of communication with these group, uh, uh, potential groups in the future. The other thing is um, one of the one of the larger projects we took on this last year uh, was at the request of Jeannie Frazier. Uh, we we uh, got a call list from seniors who received uh, fruit baskets from the then Heartland Christmas Project. And I then recruited, there were 25 volunteers who um, voluntarily took on four different names on that call list and called and spoke with their neighbors. Many of them only spoke with their neighbors once. They, they called and said, hey, do you need anything? And they said, no, actually, we don't need anything. But there are also many I know of who maintained relationships and have been involved in consistent aid uh, with those people that they initiated that relationship because of their volunteer efforts through Heartland Mutual Aid. So that those points you bring up, Gordon, I think are really important. and we've tried to keep them uh, equity and access to these resources at the forefront of our minds as we've done this. 
Hey, Gordon, I've got a question for Curtis. Uh, so I, I will wait in here on a technical question where I risk derision because I don't maybe understand it, but um, couldn't you put a uh, page on the town of Heartland's uh, website and then link there? There's already a, a page that says community support and there's a whole list of uh, resources there is instead of starting something brand new yeah um we definitely could indeed as you say there already is a page um that's up there and that page i believe correct me if i'm wrong dave is maintained by you and martin right yeah actually um, michelle it, basically martin's office yeah michelle plays a hand in the um a lot in the town website at this point yeah, and so any any sort of changes to organizations, their mission statement, their logos, anything like anything like that would require interfacing uh, with the town directly and using uh, employee town resources in order to implement those changes. So we're we're proposing aggregating that information in a way that makes it simple to update things on the part of the organization doesn't take town resources to implement those changes and also um, has a really advanced categorization and search functionality um, to uh, allow people to rapidly find organizations that are appropriate for them Thank you for the question, Mayor. Okay, um, I'll bring up one more thing, Curtis. The, the bottom line seems quite, like quite a big amount of money to request. Now, if you recall uh, last meeting or the meeting before, we had a request for another appropriation for um, I don't remember exactly what the involved the, the people who are um, sent. I think they're centered throughout the Upper Valley, including in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And and we we gave them a, a rather small percentage of what they asked for, but they seem to be happy to be for us to was that. That there again, that's going to be up to the voters, but it it went through that way, anyways. So uh, I guess what I'm asking for you is, would you also be uh, willing to consider um, considerably less uh, of a of a request, money wise? I think there are some really important distinctions between the um, appropriation request that we are proposing and the request that was put forward by the Upper Valley Population Health Council or uh, whatever that was. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not willing to say they don't do great work. I'm, I'm sure they do great work. But what I am willing to say is that every single one of these dollars that would be appropriated by the townspeople would be used directly in the town of Heartland to increase the, the, the security and well being of residents in Heartland. So, not only do I mean that all of our services would be directed towards Heartland, but I also mean that to whatever extent we need to use services we preferentially direct them to Heartland and Heartland residents. So when we have uh, requests for items that we're unable to get for free, uh, either through the food shelf or through volunteers, we preferentially go to BGs. Um, when we're looking for website design um, tools, we preferentially look for Heartland residents. Indeed, um, the information we have about the cost of website design is from a Heartland-based 
um, design company. So there are those specific policies that we have in place that make every dollar we spend impactful to Heartlanders specifically, but then also all of the Bennett, all of the dollars here would be spent with the sole goal of increasing the well-being of Heartlanders and acting as a force multiplier on the um, social service dollars that we do currently spend. So I think it's important to keep in mind that some of these things that would be force multipliers, like the forward facing <laughs> website and the internally facing um, communication tools can't really be put in just sort of partially. Um, we either have to do all of the investment sort of, we're, we're still shooting for the bare minimum investment on the website, but we have to at least put in that bare minimum investment or there is no website. And we have to at least put in this bare minimum investment to create this backend communication tool or else there is no backend communication tool. So those, those two points um, actually without the minimum level um, of services that I proposed in this letter, which really is like just about the minimum I could conceive of, um, they, they, it would be better just to not sort of have that money because it wouldn't, it doesn't, re it wouldn't really work in a half measure. The, the third line item, the incidental requests, um, is something that uh, we're asking for and is more closely aligned to our philosophical aims of allowing people to provide the help they're able to and allowing people to request the help they need. And what this incidental, this fund would allow us to do is, as I said earlier, divorce the concept of volunteering from financial responsibility. And it would allow us to work with volunteers who might feel unable to, for instance, deliver groceries because of the gas, it, the cost of gas in their car. And so they could deliver these groceries, they could volunteer their time and efforts to do that, and they could receive a reimbursement for the gas. And I think that this will, this fund will allow us to best use the volunteer resources that have made themselves available in town. So I think the short answer to your question, Gordon, is two of those line items, if they're decreased, they become pretty much non-usable. And the third one um, could could be made smaller at the discretion of either, I guess, the board or, or the townspeople, um, but was the amount we put in because we think that will help us be able to provide the services at the level we're receiving those requests. Yeah, yeah I would think that um, the last item, the incidental costs, might be um, raised by, um, by donations somehow. Because because a lot of a lot of what you're relying on on this whole project, I think, is, is volunteer um, time. Or you know, I I haven't heard of anybody uh, who I guess I don't know, but who does um, say Meals on Wheels or or taking people to appointments or whatever. I haven't heard of those people asking for gas reimbursement. Yeah. But, and maybe, usually, may happen, usually I don't they don't, but I, at least like in my conversations with people <laughs> as, as I've been an adult for a bit, pretty relatively short amount of time with my peers and contemporaries is that um, a lot of times they felt the desire to volunteer but felt restricted because of some sort of perceived financial implication of that volunteering like gas, especially in a rural area, something like that can be a meaningful factor. Uh, 
I, well, I did not? kind of, re I've recused myself, but I know Gordon doesn't see this so well. So Brian Strafolino has had his hand up for a little oh, bit. I don't see that. Yeah. Go ahead, Brian. Hey, Gordon. Yeah. I'm just curious, Curtis, uh, do you guys have a fiscal sponsor or how are you going to account for um, any monies that would come in through an, an appropriation? And would you be disclosing that to the town? I, I commend you for having the goal of trying to keep money in Heartland as much as possible. And I think that's great. And I'm, I'm just curious if you would highlight that or, or how you'd be transparent about how the money is being spent. And if you guys have a fiscal sponsor, if you're using um, Crow, or would you be establishing your own nonprofit? Yeah, so um, it could be a goal at some point in time to uh, establish our own, but um, as it currently stands, uh, we have s spoken with Crow and have agreed that we would be administered under their auspices. Um, so this would include both sort of at the state level and then informally at the at the local level as well. Um, and in terms of accountability, uh, I I I can I hadn't thought of this, Brian, but I am happy to tell you right now that every single penny will be accounted for before any appropriation request came in next year. <laughs> so uh, we, will, we will ensure accountability and would be happy to provide a, a summary report um, to the people through the website or um, to this board at their request. Dave? Dave, is there, are there any uh, tax implications or would this all just filter through the town so it wouldn't be, uh, that wouldn't be a problem? Uh, tax. Um, well, most people have to get a um, nonprofit uh, designation before they can operate something like this, but. I think it's advantageous and I think it's advantageous that they have, you know, an account set up I, when uh, ironically, when the, the farmer's market requested um, money, I looked into that. And um, from what I can tell, the language in the statute doesn't specifically state a 501c3. Um, it's a little bit more general than that. So I think it's, I think there's some discretion, but certainly, you know, the hope would be that if the voter is going to vote in the affirmative, that it's, a, you know, it's legitimate, it's up front and it, it can be accounted for. Yeah, and Gordon, I can uh, respond. We're, we've taken all the steps necessary except for submitting one document um, that I'll be doing this week to establish an uh, independent account underneath the Crow, the Community Resilience Organization. Uh, so the funds would all be, they would all go through Crow. Well, um, a couple of concerns is that we aren't we aren't saying yes or no to this because this is a voter issue. Um, I, I people may perceive that the select board is endorsing this, and I'm, I'm concerned that about that uh, because I may or may not be. I don't know. Um, as a member of the board, but so, but we do have to remember that if we, what we're really deciding here is whether we should put this on the warning or not. Um, more thoughts from anyone? I'll go ahead and make a motion, uh, Gordon. Good. Uh, in full consideration of what you just said, 
I make a motion to place the appropriation for the Heartland Mutual Aid Group on the town warning. Okay. I'll second that. Thank you, Mary. Okay. Um, I think we we probably don't need any more discussion. Is there anything else someone is wants to say? And then I would look for a vote. Bill, aye. Mary, aye. Martha, aye. And I'm, I mean, we're going to remain a little skeptical, so I, I think I will abstain. But we've got the three votes we need. Uh, so thank you, Gordon. Thank you, everyone. And I do want to acknowledge something Nancy said um, that the we have had the, our website has been hosted on the library website through this last year, and that has been a great help for us. And I want to thank Nancy for having offered us that temporary home over this last year and thank the board for consideration of this request. Okay. All right. So let's see. Uh, yes, Bill? Um, I don't notice on the agenda, but in my packet, which I got out of the mailbox at five after five, um, did include the um, uh, auditor's report. Is that for discussion tonight, or is that just informational? I think it's, it's not on the agenda. Dave? No, nope, it's uh, strictly informational. Okay. For your for your bedtime reading. Oh, great! Thank you. I can't wait. Were there any findings that you want to bring to our attention, and we'll just talk about that at another time? Uh, no, there were no uh, there were no um, you know findings of of of, of, of no no. That's in the last part of the, the the audit, and there wasn't there wasn't any this year. <clears throat> Good news. Yes. Okay. Let's let's move on down to the um, manager's notes, uh, <clears throat> Dave. So we can skip over the Merrick Campbell and come back to that after we, uh, uh, I guess, adjourn the meeting. Yep. So the the two biggest things, obviously, the weather. Um, last two weeks, the the thirty inches of snow followed the week later by two inches of rain. Uh, wreaked havoc on our roads, um, really kind of stressed the, the highway department uh, to a degree. Um, we were, the, the night of the 30 inches, um, we were out until about 9 o'clock that night before we got everyone cleaned up. There were some roads that went unplowed um, throughout the day. Uh, however, we did have um, one truck experience engine problems, another one um, was stuck, so we were down uh, two vehicles throughout the day. We did pick up slack with the grader. Uh, also used the bucket loader to an extent, um, so it did slow us down, uh, not to mention just the extent of the snow, uh, how quick it fell, and um, the rate that we were kind of dealing with throughout the day. Uh, uh, following that, the, the rain um, did create Washouts did create some problems. Town Farm Road was closed for afternoon and the next morning. Uh, we had some washouts um, also on Weed Road, um, Advent Hill Road, Ellison Road comes to mind, uh, Morley Road out towards South Woodstock um, was problematic. We had some issues with Densmore Hill. Come with some of the traditional problem spots. Um, there was in, in some of these places, particularly um, Town Farm Road, you've heard me talk about the need to have some ditching uh, in some of the non-hydro areas. Uh, during the earlier budget discussions, we talked about Town Farm Road um, and with the meltdown and the rain, some of our issues became more transparent. Uh, and that one in particular is kind of a good case study. Uh, we did come out of it on the other end. Um, Parts are still a little bit rough, but um, again, a pretty good swing and uh, has kept us busy for the last two weeks. Kept the highway crew busy um, for both holidays, Christmas uh, and New Year's. Uh, they were out 
both days. So um, unfortunate for them, but um, just kind of goes to show the work that we um, that they do um, while we're all enjoying ourselves. Uh, the next big item of discussion is the three corners intersection. I've been kind of telegraphing that this is a possibility. Um, I did have a meeting last Thursday um, on that. Uh, that is officially has been put off until um, early fall of next year. Uh, um, actually, year that we're in 2021. <clears throat> but the RFP uh, won't be ready to go out until early fall. We're still wrapping up the NEPA process. You've heard me talk about that a bit. Uh, we're still haggling with some of the details with the utilities um, to put that uh, so that can be presented to the state of Vermont. We'll still need to get one easement from the folks at the mansion, um, basically a temporary construction easement, but um, we'll need to have Rob Mamby uh, do that up. Uh, and he's pretty straight out at the moment, uh, not to mention we can't make that official until the NEPA process is done. So um, we're not where we wanted to be to get that out by March or, or April. Um, so it looks as though it's gonna be put back until uh, early fall. Uh, disappointing, but um, again, it was a tight deadline, and um, we just couldn't um, just couldn't get the ducks in order. Um, but the project is still very much moving forward, um, and uh, still very much active, and um, um, meet almost weekly on that. <clears throat> a couple of the smaller things: uh, Martin is in the process of doing year-end um, responsibilities. Uh, rec center is on a little bit of a break. They'll be on a little bit of a break this week as well as the um, kids are home for a remote week. Uh, they come back uh, to school next week and after school we'll pick up then. Uh, and it doesn't look as though basketball um, will be a stretch. Um, uh, doubtful that that will come to fruition. Um, still not completely out, uh, but looking doubtful. Um, lastly, or maybe two more things, uh, Emma has left us. She has gone back to Boston um, for school. Um, we enjoyed having Emma here. I thought she did a great job. Um, was personable and um, friendly and um, just did, was just a good worker all around. And um, Greater Upper Valley Solid Waste District, I mentioned this last meeting, um, they are citing a solar array uh, on their property um, of the uh, proximity of the landfill that they had cited 20 years ago. Uh, I expect to see them possibly next meeting at the 19th to present that and get uh, a designated preferred site from the select board. Um, so expect to see them come down the pike. Uh, I've been mentioning it to you on and off, Heartland Winter Trails. We mentioned this last meeting. Andrea was here last meeting and I spoke to the board um, as part of that town manager update, uh, still in process. Uh, it is um, in Rob Mamby's lap. Uh, he did just recently have surgery, so um, waiting for him to kind of come out of that. And uh, hopefully we'll see something this week that we can push forward. That does it. Um, so, Dave, you don't have anything else? Any correspondence? Or? <clears throat> uh, actually, I gave you two correspondence. One um, <clears throat> of note is the equalization study results um, from yeah. the state of Vermont. Yeah. Um, Curtis, you and I have talked to her. You brought this up at a meeting at one point uh, about, you know, looking at, you know, I think it was the North Hartwood building there that was for sale and much more than what it's appraised at. <clears throat> you were kind of questioning, you know, what the sale value is and, and where our assessments are at. Uh, we get the CLA yearly. Uh, it came out, we have 100.6. Um, that is very pretty well right on, um, right where we need to be. The only 
concerning thing in the equalization study results, and we went over this last year, it was almost the same exact uh, results, is the COD, the coefficient of dispersion, is a 13.5%. So we're essentially getting the average sale price um, is kind of right on. Uh, however, with certain sales, our appraisals are either kind of a, a high number above the sale price or below. So you've got the sale price, kind of got the average, but our appraisals are coming in either above the sale price um, by a pretty decent percentage or below the sale price by a pretty decent percentage. Yet the, CO, uh, the CLA is pretty well right on. 13.5% uh, is kind of a high number, so I think that we need to kind of continue to look at that. And I know that the listers learned several things after the last reappraisal. They're kind of accumulating data over the next couple of years, and they'll work to correct some of those things. So it's not lost on us. It's not lost on the listers, but, um, you know, we'll need to work through that. Um, for instance, a 20% COD I believe would, you know, initiate or or there would be a need to initiate a reappraisal. So we're not at 20 percent. It would be a high number. Um, but the 13.5 isn't as low as, you know, perhaps we'd like it to be. But, um, you know, there's work to be done. It's kind of a marathon and um, they'll continue to hone in on that. And um, hopefully we can bring that down over. It'll be a several year process, but um, something to keep an eye on. Man. Dave, can I ask you a couple questions about that? Well, uh, you can try. Okay. So uh, COD was pretty similar to last year? Oh, the COD? Yeah, I don't have it, but I recall it being um, in the low teens there, probably something similar. Okay. Uh, so it's it's pretty to go from 13 percent to 20 percent is a pretty substantial jump in in heartland the average home like around two hundred and fifty thousand dollars i think that's an average off of about an additional twenty thousand dollars per house it would have to be an average of an extra twenty thousand dollars per house off i think to get up to that 20%. Stacy might know better than me, but I'm wondering um, if I can only presume that we anticipate that increasing uh, when we move from Doug uh, to a less experienced lister. And I'm wondering if there's anything um, that we could put in place to try to do our best to keep that down because a town-wide reappraisal is a real big undertaking. I don't, I don't have to say that. You all know that. So, I, I uh, and I can think I can speak for Stacy here. Um, so yeah, Doug um, was doing a really good job. Um, Stacy was a part of that um, and a part of that reappraisal and um, had some experience prior to coming to us. Uh, I think that, you know, and I only I only stick my head in there and kind of dabble around when when necessary. Or I'm really bored, but um, I, my understanding is is upon the reappraisal, you know, there's there's kind of lessons learned from the reappraisal, and it's not like we can just you know knee jerk start changing numbers. You know, we need data to show changes that we may have a hunch are, are there. So I think that, um, you know, again, this is a long-term process from where we've come, but I think that there's a decent understanding um, with Doug and Stacy, and that'll carry through with Stacy as to what some of the issues that we didn't quite grab hold of during the reappraisal that we would have liked to and have been as successful as we would have liked. I think we we've, we've got some understanding to that. And I think it's a matter of being able to collect the data to turn around and essentially prove the thesis, so to speak, um, or the hypothesis that, okay, 
you know, maybe the neighborhood boundaries or something weren't quite right or, or something to that effect. And okay, we've got three years of sales data now to kind of back up our, our hypothesis. So I think that um, I don't see a big jump going from 13 to 20. Um, yeah. You know, it's been steady now for the second year. I think that the goal would be to take what we know and kind of refine what we know and kind of work that number down. Um, you know, and I think that, you know, more time, more sales is going to do that. And ultimately, it's a lengthy process, but we should really be shooting to do reappraisals about every five years or so, um, just to keep those numbers honest and to keep the process going and to um, keep on top of things. And I, I, I want to maybe maybe Stacy has data on this. Maybe they give this to the listers office in particular. But um, so having these long serving skilled listers like Doug and Stacy is really valuable. Um, for the last year, at least, we also had a, an appointed lister. And so it could be the case if if it continues going forward that the board is asked to appoint listers, it would behoove us as a board to look for the most experienced, most highly qualified ones because things like this COD going up could actually be pretty costly to, to the town. So I won't get into the whole, uh, how we appoint a lister uh, to the position um, other than the town presently has uh, a board of lister or a um, board of assessor form um, and there's certain uh, criteria under statute that the town can appoint one um, but until we you know unless we were to change uh, you know formally make a change to an actual assessor um, you know I think that um, uh, I think the present makeup is good. Um, yeah, that was. I wasn't of, saying we should do anything. That was just a comment yeah. as to if that if that issue comes up again, like this is the sort of thing we should keep in mind when it comes up. So, what I would say, Curtis, is is much like um, the treasurer's position. These positions are not easy. Yeah, and yes. it has grown over you know, the last 30 years, and at this point in time is particularly complicated uh, between the school and the state, and actually the state has created so much complexity for themselves that they themselves are somewhat confused um, on what they and we should be doing. So I think that, um, I think that what we need to be careful of, Curtis, is that we could wake up so let's just say something happened to stacy tomorrow um we could wake up in a position that there is not enough capable people to formulate um you know a, a board or we may not get enough volunteers uh to formulate a board or those that volunteers don't have the skills to do what needs to be done that's a huge um issue and the ability or the choice to go to an assessor is there um we're not there yet but it's always something to keep in mind okay thanks okay so does anyone else have anything to bring up before we adjourn do we have uh merrick campbell we do we have to adjourn now and uh, the camera turned off and before we can is there uh, anything more to say about uh, mr rockwood's uh, letter um that's great okay. i don't know um, i imagine dave could talk for 30 minutes about it if if given the flexibility <laughs> I would suggest if anyone wants to have more info to talk to Dave about that on their own time, maybe. Uh, so.
So, Gordon, I think you just need to be clear uh, at this point in the meeting um, with the, the folks that are still sitting in that um, the, the loan agenda item we have left is a Mary Campbell fund request. Yeah. And that um, we ask that the, the people sitting in on the meeting respect the privacy of the person re making the request. Uh, it pertains a family's name, it pertains, you know, financial information, and it pertains needs of particular people and, and a request to um, things. I see uh, before I go too much farther, um, Curtis, you put a question out on the, the, the chat. Stacy said she had a point to make. Um, I, I would just ask if she still had that point. And I don't know if I see her anymore, actually. Okay. So essentially due to the sensitivity of the discussion, we simply ask that people um, allow us to discuss uh, this information in private um, and make yeah, a decision in, as far as offering assistance to the family. The, the, the basic problem is that there is no provision in the uh, executive session uh, law to allow this type of discussion. Even though we, we have asked for that sort of legislation, nothing has happened. So we, we, out of respect for the people who are making the request, we do it anyways. So let's, uh, can we have a motion to adjourn the meeting? I'll move to adjourn. No. And Bill seconds. Yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.